Hey, what's up, everyone? And thank you so much for dropping into another episode here on the Path to Freedom podcast. This is episode 128. Today, I'm joined by Dan Reese and Dana Monitas of the Milkshake Factory. Really cool concept that I've started working with recently. Uh, what I think is one of the, the brands that's poised for exceptional growth over the coming years. Uh, they're partnered with Franworth. They're partnered with the Repum Group, both of which you know I've had the the opportunity to discuss here on the podcast. And uh, you know, for those that have listened to me for a while, you know that I'm not a big proponent of franchises in the food and beverage category for a number of different reasons. But you know, Milkshake Factory very very different in terms of the business model, the simplicity. So a lot of the pain points that, you know, you typically see in many food and beverage franchise concepts uh, have been eliminated in this model with the milkshake factory. So I think there's actually a lot to like about this business, just business from a simplicity standpoint. Dan and Dana share a lot of good information on that. Also just fascinating, you know, kind of story in terms of how the milkshake factory came to be, uh, you know, kind of the origin story of of what got them to this point where they're now franchising the business. So really interesting uh, kind of backstory from Dana and her family. And also another couple things that just want to point out before we get into the episode, you know, this is very much an emerging brand. They just started franchising. They don't have any franchise locations open and operating at the time that we recorded this podcast. So in a lot of people's eyes, that's, you know, certainly riskier than a more established franchise with, you know, more of a track record and more data in terms of how, how the franchisees are performing in their business. And, and, you know, all of that's true to some extent with an emerging brand, but a couple of things I point out that, that give me the confidence to work with emerging brands like the Milkshake Factory. The first thing is, as I already mentioned, they are partnered with Franworth and Repum Group. I'll link both of those companies' uh, websites in the show notes in case you're not familiar with them. But, you know, this is a perfect example of where the founders and the executives of this company, you know, realize that while they may know the business inside and out and have great experience, they have not yet franchised a business and they knew there was going to be a learning curve with that. So they were willing to go out and find partners that do have extensive experience in franchising. So that checks a big box in, in terms of what I'm looking for, you know, in emerging brands that I'm willing to, to work with. And the second thing is experience um, and, and capitalization, right? So as Dana and Dan share, they both have incredibly impressive resumes and, and experience prior to, to Milkshake Factory. Um, so they're, they're clearly, you know, more than competent, a uh, ton of great experience that they're going to be able to leverage as they grow the franchise system and start supporting franchisees in their businesses um, and, and plenty of capital as well, which, which Dana explains um, as she tells a little bit of the, the story of how milkshake factory got started so anyways ton of good stuff in this episode um we'll go ahead and drop in without further ado this is dan reese and dana monatos of the milkshake factory thanks for having us yeah yeah appreciate it. yeah yeah it's my pleasure um my pleasure but we were just chatting a little bit before we started recording that you know this is this is a brand that's pretty different from a lot of the brands that that I get to work with. And, you know, I've, I've, I, I'm sure at this point, numerous times on this podcast talked about why I specifically don't work with many franchises in the food and beverage um, sector. Uh, but this is different. You know, this is uh, obviously milkshakes, uh, you know, primarily that we're talking about here. And, and so I think you guys have a really unique model in that you're, obviously in this category of, of food or, or beverages, but you've eliminated a lot of the pain points that, you know, these, these types of businesses traditionally have and, and, you know, that kind of scare a lot of people away from, from owning food and beverage franchises. So um, it's, it's unique in that way, but there's also, I think a lot of, 
uh, other unique factors, really cool kind of origin story. Um, so Dana, maybe you could kick us off and just tell us a little bit about, you know, how the milkshake factory got started. Um, I know there's some pretty cool family heritage, uh, you know, that, that led you to the point of starting the business in the first place. So would love it if you shared some of that story with us. Yeah, I would love to. And and it is it is a really unique uh, food and beverage concept, like you said, and, and we'll get into the meat of that a little bit later. But how we started was that my grand, great grandparents uh, came over from Greece in 1914. They came through Ellis Island, uh, your typical Im immigrant story, settled in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and they came to pursue the American dream. Um, they the only thing they knew how to do when they got here was to make their candies on the street corner, which they did. They saved enough to buy a retail shop. Uh, and that was our family's first chocolate shop and soda fountain. Uh, and the, the, the concept of Milkshake Factory actually came out of that. Uh, I'll send you one of the photos. It's this black and white photo of my great grandfather and his son standing in front of their soda fountain with a big milkshake uh, right on the, on the counter in front of them. And uh, when I when I came up with this concept and we implemented it in one of our stores, that's where that came from. So that history, we are steeped history uh, deep in in the history that we came from. Um, I was my brothers and I are fourth generation in the business. We are fortunate. We were fortunate enough to grow up with my great grandmother who started the business and came over from Greece. She lived till she was ninety nine. Wow. And so we had the ability to learn directly from her, and all of those values and and uh the, the the what she taught us about quality and products and attention to detail and taking care of your employees that all came down from her to my great grandparents and my parents and then into us and we all got to grow up in that and learn that so not only was it extremely fun just being a kid growing up in a candy factory a chocolate factory we actually don't realize the values and the lessons that we, that we have today are from that. Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, just, I, I can't even imagine, you know, coming to a, a new country and, and starting a business quite literally from scratch and, and, you know, there's the determination and grit that that would take, but so cool that you got to, you know, learn directly from her. You said she lived to 99. Yeah, she lived till she was 99, so she passed away when I was uh, in high school. Okay. Uh, so we really did grow up with her. And and honestly, I mean, it was, we got to take my kids, my kids are 8, 10, and 12. And last summer, uh, we ended up to New York, went down to Ellis Island, saw the same places that they walked through um, when they came here. And it was really just, it's just amazing to think about. They didn't speak the language. They only brought the one bag with them. And they had to figure out how to make it work. And they were, by the way, they were teenagers, oh, right? Wow. They weren't like in their 20s and 30s. And, you know, all their family was back in Greece. And they were in their late teens and, and uh, early 20s to come over here to figure out how to make it work. It really is the the American dream story. And, and very cool that, you know, you guys have kind of brought it full circle. And, you know, it's now a, a franchise opportunity where other people can you know, kind of plug into to what you guys have built and and build their own version of the American dream. And so is it safe to say that that the the milkshake factories, milkshakes and, and chocolate will extend your life if if your great grandmother lived to, to 99? Is that is that a fair statement? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, and, and who we are today, I mean, we really still um, focus on the quality. That is something that she taught us in day like from the beginning and we won't compromise on that. We sell a premium product um, and we have a premium experience. And that is something that we always want to stay true to. Yeah, absolutely. So, so at what point did, did you really create the, the concept that is kind of, you know, grown into the milkshake factory that, that we see now? It's, it's actually kind of a little bit of funny story. So um, while I was in college, I had this opportunity during one of my business courses uh, to work on this project. Uh, and it was, uh, I obviously chose our, our business and our store um, in Pittsburgh, our, our chocolate and ice cream shop. And that was very seasonal business. It was just a chocolate shop at the time. It had a uh, very seasonal seasonality for the holidays. So Christmas, Valentine's Day, and Easter. Uh, and I really wanted to figure out how to increase the summer sales. Well, we we had a, an ice cream case in the back of the store and just scoops of ice cream. 
wasn't really a big part of the business. And I wanted to figure out how to balance out the season. So I wanted to pull forward the ice cream. And this milkshake factory concept I just came up with. And, you know, at heart, we we are candy makers. We know how to make flavors and ingredients and syrups and and all of that um, that goes into a good piece of chocolate or, or cooking candy. Um, and so uh, I'll, I had this idea and my dad and I went into the, the kitchen, the candy kitchen and started making syrups and flavors. Um, and we said, what if we just, you know, really made some really good quality milkshakes, all these different flavors that most people can't get anymore. Go back to the classic milkshake, uh, but bring some of, of today's flavors forward. Uh, and we did that. And all of a sudden, this chocolate shop that has been known as a chocolate shop for decades, all of a sudden became known as the milkshake factory that sold chocolate. And this just quickly organically flipped and started to grow and gain traction in the city. And it was still a mom and pop shop at that time. Yeah. Uh, and so we it's not it wasn't the brand that you would see today, but the concept of everything and all the products that we created back then are what we pulled forward into today's brand. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. So it really came out of a out of a school project. Um Dan, where where did you you know at at what point did you get involved? Um because just so the the listeners understand so Dana, you're the the founder and CEO and Dan, you're the the brand president. So where where along the line did did you plug in? Yeah, so I've been working with Dana and her family for coming up on a decade now, which is pretty wow. crazy to say. So, uh, yeah, I, quick background on me, kind of traditional business guy, consulting, private equity, um, got my MBA from Duke University and then went to work for Heinz North America, worked my way up through that organization, went with a 3G capital acquisition, was the youngest global partner there. And I ran brands like Heinz Ketchup and big CPG brands, you know, did the Super Bowl commercial and all that. And then I was part of the small team that helped integrate Kraft and Heinz back in 2015 during that merger. So um, my last job there was was managing that $2 billion Kraft Heinz condiments portfolio. But, you know, that was a, a pretty wild time uh, mer merging Kraft and Heinz. And, and quite frankly, I wasn't having a whole lot of fun at that yeah. point. And I wanted I wanted something different. So I was the first person to ever, ever walk in that partnership group. And that's when I met uh, Dana's brother, Chris, when, you know, they had just left the White House, which is a whole other story, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, back to the family chocolate business. And they were just getting into Costco um, with their chocolate business. So they kind of hired me as the business slash CPG guy. And I ended up bringing a whole bunch of people. Um, I used to work with at Kraft Heinz and, you know, we grew that chocolate business from, you know, essentially nothing to about, you know, 50 million in revenue. So we were the, you know, Inc. 5,000 fastest growing company in America for six straight years. Wow. So we had a great run with the chocolate business and, you know, that was really the focus. And, you know, when I started back in 2015, the milkshake factory existed, but it was just the one store, right? It was, you know, mom's mom's old chocolate shop that had been rebranded to milkshake factory. And then, you know, the, the second store opened in 2016. So we worked on milkshake factory, but the chocolate was, uh, business was still a priority. Sure. Um, and then it wasn't until 2018 that we really saw, we saw how successful that second store was. And then we're like, wait a minute, like we might be onto something here just because people people loved it so much where we wanted to open across Pittsburgh with a college store, University of Pittsburgh, a uh, suburban store, multiple suburban stores, urban stores. And we kept opening them and it just we, we haven't found one that doesn't work yet uh, and kind of just rode that wave. And, and built that out, you know, pre-COVID. And we'll talk about all that. We've since opened two more store, corporate stores after COVID. Uh, and then, you know, we got out of that chocolate business about two or three years ago and have been, you know, full-time on Milkshake Factory kind of through COVID, which is obviously an interesting time for us. And then last year is when we really got serious about, you know, thinking about franchising, which we can get into. Yeah. So I was, I was curious as you started opening, you know, other locations, if you were already thinking, you know, franchising at that point, or if that that kind of revelation came a little bit later. But you know, a couple things I'll I'll point out. You know, based on what both of you have shared, you know, up to this point. Um, for for those listening, you know, this is a brand that certainly, you know, as we sit here today, falls into you know the emerging brand category, right? Really, just getting started. You know, on the the franchising, you know, journey of the business, but. I mean, number one, you know, 
th- and this is why I love to have, you know, founders and, and key executives on the podcast, because it's so important for people to get a sense of who's behind the brands, you know, who's making strategic decisions, especially as a brand is really just getting started out yet poised for, for serious growth over the coming years. Um, so, you know, you've got, even though I'm a Chapel Hill guy, I'll, I'll Duke MBA is pretty good. I'll, I'll give you that. Um, so, you know, Duke yeah. MBA, <laughs> private equity and investment banking and, and, uh, Dan, you know, teased the fact that, that Dana, you know, was involved in, in the white house at one point. So we've got to make sure she shares a little bit of that story with us too, but, you know, very experienced, you know, people behind the brand, huge, you know, family chocolate business, um, you know, doing business with Costco and other huge corporations like that. So, you know, well capitalized, well experienced, you know, these are the things that, that, you know, we as consultants look for in the emerging brands that we partner with. Um, Because again, there's so much that comes with, you know, growing a brand, uh, making that transition from just having, you know, maybe multiple corporate owned locations to now we've got franchisees that we've got to support and teach the business. And, you know, we're growing on top of that. So um, I really appreciate you guys sharing a little bit of the the background. Um, and and I, I think it, it'll help give folks a lot of confidence in the fact that, yeah, that may be new as a franchise, but there's, there's actually quite a bit of history and experience here. But Dana, can you, can you tell us a little bit about the White House? I, I feel like I'd be doing the listeners a disservice if we didn't weave some of that in. Yeah. And that it was a, is a really, uh, really exciting time uh, that we got to participate in and, and, and uh, serve the president of the United States. Um, we, <clears throat> prior to um, going back into the family business, uh, my brothers and I had other careers in Washington, DC. Um, we worked at the white house uh, for president Bush um, and we worked in the office of presidential advance. So we handled uh uh, 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 executed events logistically, domestically, and internationally for the president. Wow. So anywhere he traveled, we'd go in advance, set up the trips, um, prepared my, my responsible for his schedule, um, line by line, all the information that went in to it, um, as well as uh, traveling. Uh, Chris traveled to probably 80 plus countries with him, um, flew on Air Force One, um, was in New Orleans right after Hurricane Katrina. I mean, you can imagine... Yeah you know, the, 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 all the places that we have been, uh, in travel to. Uh, so it was, it was not only we got to see everything and got to see the world and it was, but it also taught us, continue to teach us what our parents and grandparents and great grandparents instilled in us is, uh, the attention to detail. There is no room for error. You're dealing with the United States, right? So like the level of the bar is the bar is high. Yeah. And uh, you are expected. It is a great place and a great environment. And he was a fantastic leader. But you are expected to hit that bar. Um, and that is what we knew we were set up to do. And, and we did it. And so uh, that at, that was quite an experience. You can imagine, uh, you know, what, what we did with that. Um, but after that, and after the administration ended, that was time we decided let's really go back into the family business and, and grow this. Yeah. That's amazing. That's fascinating. Um, I bet you have some, some incredible stories. Um, I got to hear him speak only a few years ago. It was at a like CEO conference that I was at and he did a small little, you know, town hall type thing. There was probably only, you know, 40 or 50 of us in the room. Um, he's, he's, you know, an impressive business person, obviously in his own right and, and had so much, you know, good advice and and wisdom to share, but he was hilarious. I mean, he had us cracking up the whole time. It was like, you know, part, you know, kind of motivational speech part, like stand up comedian, uh, show almost like he was, he was uh in 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 the mood to crack some jokes and and he had us rolling. He is always in the mood to crack jokes. He is such a fantastic person. The whole Bush family, um, you know, President Bush and his personality. It, you wanted to wake up and go to work for him every day. I believe um, it. Could not wait to get out of bed just to be able to go serve him and his how he you know he expected a lot out of you, which he should have. Uh, but he really just his personality and the people and the senior staff that he surrounded himself with 
were just top quality people. Yeah, I could see it for sure. Um, well, that's incredible. That's that's so cool. Uh, so so fast forward to today. You know, you guys just you know kind of started the the process of franchising. Um, so where are you at right now in terms of you know number of corporate locations? I know we were talking as we started recording. You just had your your first discovery day, so you've got you know, some people that are, you know, probably pretty close to to making a decision to to become franchisees. So that's exciting. But, you know, give us kind of the snapshot of of where we are right now in terms of number of locations. Uh, sure. Uh, right now we have uh, 10 corporate locations in Pittsburgh. Uh, we also have a licensed location in PPG Paints Arena, you know, where the Pittsburgh Penguins play in the NHL. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, technically 11 or 10, depending on how you define it. Uh, so that was kind of, you know, we almost saturated the Pittsburgh market. You know, maybe there's room for another one or two at some point. And, and that's kind of where we hit the hit the, hit the decision of, you know, just kind of run that business. You can expand via corporate development or you can expand via franchising. And that's kind of where we, you know, we're not, we're not, or we weren't franchise experts, but we were business experts. And that's where we spent a lot of time last year, really educating ourselves around franchising and what it takes to be an emerging franchisor. And, and quite frankly, like even looking at the data and likelihood of, of being a successful emerging franchisor, um, you know, the data isn't overly encouraging, right? Yeah. So Dane, yeah. Dane and I spent a lot of time uh, kind of thinking about that and, and how do we really position ourselves to be successful? And, you know, we call it stacking the deck in our favor. Uh, and that's why, you know, we talked to most franchise development com uh, companies in the country and we were fortunate enough to partner with Franwork. So if anyone's familiar with them, they have a fantastic executive team. Um, so we have a lot of wonderful mentors and, you know, they have eight brands, you know, they get, I think, 400 inquiries a year and they'll maybe do one, yeah. maybe two partnership deals. So uh, yeah. I feel really fortunate. You know, they were supporting us at our discovery day yesterday and, and they're just such fantastic partners. And then, you know, obviously with, with the framework partnership, uh, also they, they have a partnership with all the whole entire Repum group. So we're, we're with the Repum team and the Buildum team. So, you know, when Dana and I look around, we're saying, hey, we, we have a lot of really sophisticated franchise expertise. You know, we, we can teach you how to, to run a milkshake shop and we've learned a lot. And, you know, we weren't ready for this at store three or store four, but, you know, at store 10, the one that we we just opened our, a store in March, and that was kind of the franchise blueprint store. Um, you know, a really tight, really capital efficient, thirteen hundred square feet, and that was the one that's like it, it just you know all the things that we've learned throughout all this time. In you know, I, I should mention our, our VP of operations has been with us for seven years, uh, and yeah. he really gets a lot of credit for revolutionizing the entire business of people are blown away by how simple this business is to run. So like yeah. you mentioned, you know, I know you guys don't do a lot of F&B and F&B kind of gets a bad, a bad rap. And, and sometimes that's, that's justifiable. Yeah. Um, so we're kind of the, we're, we're when we'll get into our, our candidates, but kind of the F&B personality without all of the drawbacks, I think is, is a great fit for us. So, so all that, you know, fast forward, we spent the, the, Front half of 2023, really getting ready. You know, we file our FBD in May and, and all the things that come with that. And, you know, we've kind of been out marketing ourselves for you know, a month or two. And we've been, been quite frankly, pretty blown away by the interest. And our first discovery day, like you mentioned, was was yesterday and had a lot of wonderful folks that, that came out to Pittsburgh. And, you know, we can talk all day about numbers and the FBD. Like once people come to Pittsburgh and see the stores and meet the team, and most importantly, taste the product yeah. that's when people are like okay i get it i get it now right so yeah we're kind of at this really exciting inflection point of uh, things are getting real for us and we've been very impressed with the the quality of folks um that that have been have been brought to us by our team yeah that's that's incredible you guys are um you know getting ready to start running really fast it sounds like but you know, I'm glad you brought up the the relationships or the partnerships with Franworth and you know Repum Group. Uh, I've had folks from from both of those organizations as well as other brands that that they've partnered with here on the show. And you know, I think this is something that's so important that that you know you guys were were wise enough to to see, which is you know you've got all this incredible experience as we've talked about yet you know this this franchising thing was new, right? So who can we go out with? 
you know, go out there and, and partner with that's got that experience, right? So, you know, this is really the the perfect combination of, you know, the the industry expertise plus the the franchising expertise. And so many emerging brands only have one of those two. Um, you know, so for me, it gives so much confidence that, you know, this is going to be done the right way. Um, because you have, you know, these, these partners that have so much experience and such a good track record when it comes to building other, other franchise brands. Also the fact that you have, you know, 10 or 11 corporate owned locations that you've already opened, right? That's very, very different now that you're ready to start helping franchisees open these locations so different than if you had just one or two, right? And and you've done it once or twice. The fact that you've done it 10 times and and Dan, I love how you kind of talked about the most recent one was really all the learnings that you'd taken from these other, you know, 10 or nine or 10 locations. And, you know, this is how we're going to teach franchisees to do it. Small footprint, capital efficiency. Um, I, I think that's incredibly valuable. So um, those are the things, you know, from where I sit, seeing so many different emerging brands that, you know, I look for to say, hey, this is something I'm willing to to really jump on board of early and not, you know, sit back and wait and see for a year or two to see, see, you know, are they able to sell any? Are they able to get them open? How are they doing after they open? You know, you guys have, have definitely got the the recipe for success here. But speaking of recipes, you've, uh, you know, alluded to this already, the simplicity of the model. So, again, because people listening to my show hear me talk all the time about why not food and beverage, but why milkshake and chocolate? Yeah, I'll I'll start as the, the business stuff. And then Dana, as the fourth generation chocolatier, can get into a little bit about the quality and just how important that is. Um, and that's everything, right? And that's kind of our, our big non-negotiable. But, you know, our RC, and then really Sean, Sean, our VP of operations, who I mentioned, gets all the credit for this. You know, when, when he started seven years ago, like, even if people think that milkshake factory is this overnight thing, like we've been doing this for a very, very long time. So this could be one of those, you know, overnight success stories, quote unquote. But, uh, you know, when he started, you know, we, we had all these different flavors of ice cream and our employees were scooping, scooping ice cream. And, and that's why if you go to your ice cream shop and order a milkshake, um, you know, things kind of come to a grinding halt. So our secret is really, you know, we make our own ice cream in store and Dana can talk about that quality. And it's some of the best ice cream you've ever had. And we were very thoughtful and intentional with that recipe. Um, but I call it our, our menu is the illusion of complexity, right? So you come in on the consumer side and you're wowed by this big, beautiful milkshake menu and chocolates and sundaes. Um, but it's all really, it's all, it's all from one vanilla ice cream base, right? So really making all of our products is, is vanilla ice cream. Uh, and then really high quality inclusions, we have proprietary syrup. So you can never replicate the milkshakes that we make just by going to the grocery store. It is all custom proprietary stuff. But once you get behind the counter, you know, I mean, Wes, you could come and we'd have you making the best milkshake you've ever had in probably less than five minutes. And you'd be like, oh, that's it. And we'd be like, yep. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the magic of how simple this is. And, you know, we take a lot of pride in that. And that's why we didn't really realize it when we were doing it. I mean, we were just trying to run a good business. And then we had a lot of franchise folks come in and say, wow, this is unbelievable how tight this operation is. And this is perfect for franchising. So um, Dana, do you want to talk a little bit about the, the product quality and, and, and some of that? Yeah, yeah. And and as Dan already said, the, the illusion of complexity um, when it comes to the process, yeah. the complexity has already done when it comes to the product side and what we have developed. So um, and we have that already figured out. It took uh, it took a while to nail down our ice cream our ice cream base and our recipe for that. But that is proprietary for us. As Dan said, we make our uh, own ice cream in house daily, uh, and that really is the 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 key to kind of creating this this premium product. Um, and on top of that, not only is that the core, but then we have our own proprietary purees and syrups and ingredients that go into making that milkshake. Um, when you really think about what we're doing, we're actually making ice cream to order. 
Um, if you went and got strawberry ice cream when they made it at a factory, well, what do they start with? Vanilla ice cream and they add strawberry puree and strawberries uh, and then freeze it and it comes out of the batch freezer, right? So we're doing that fresh in milkshake tins for every single order. And so that quality that we have in the, the pairing of those ingredients, it's not that we just go buy a strawberry syrup off the shelf and we say, okay, let's use that, bring that in. It's not going to work for us. We're, we're, our, our bar is too high for that. And we really have, have to have those, those subtle, the, the best pairings and, and the, the subtle nuances between the flavors and, and the bite and the size of the ingredient and, and how we're handling it. A lot of people think we just, you know, a milkshake is throwing whatever ingredients you want into a tin and blending it up. Yeah. And that's what most people do. And, and that's, that's great for maybe a home milkshake. Sure. Uh, but that's not what you're getting at the milkshake factory. There is a, a lot of, uh, a lot that goes into the creating of the recipe and every single ingredient that we bring in. It sounds like it. And and I believe I'd heard it one time that you guys went out and, and hired like the world's leading ice cream scientist. I didn't even know there was such a thing. And I, I may not be getting that exactly right. But, you know, it sounds like you guys brought in some some leading experts to help you develop this proprietary, you know, ice cream that that has set the bar so high. If you're listening to this podcast, then there's a good chance that you're looking to create more freedom in your own life. There's also a good chance that you realize that owning your own business can be a great way to take more control of your livelihood and create more of that freedom that we're all looking for. Also, if you've been listening to the show for a while, you realize that I specialize in franchise ownership. In addition to owning franchise businesses myself, I have a franchise consulting firm, Path to Freedom where I help people navigate what is typically an overwhelming process of understanding franchising, identifying specific franchise companies that could be a fit, and then conducting the due diligence in a thorough and efficient manner with those franchise brands. My whole purpose here is to leverage my experience working for franchisors, owning franchises myself, and how we've been able to use that to create more freedom in our lives and help you determine if that could be a path that makes sense for you as well. So if any of this sounds interesting, if you've considered business ownership in the past, whether you've explored franchising specifically or not, I'd love to connect with you. I'd love to learn more about you and what it is that you're working towards in your life and determine if I may be in a position to help. A great starting point is the link below in the show notes, which will take you to a short form to fill out and you'll receive a free copy of an ebook that I've put together, The Seven Steps to Freedom Through Franchise Ownership. That'll also get us connected and I'd love to set up an introductory call where I can explain a little bit more about the process that I use to help people determine if franchise ownership could be a great way to start charting their own path to freedom. So click the link below in the show notes, receive the ebook, and let's get connected. I'd love to hear from you. And if there's a common theme in what you're hearing today, as you can tell, we're not afraid to go out and find the best of the best and bring them in to continue to build this brand. So yeah, we, we, uh, the, the head of the, uh, what Penn state creamery and, uh, uh, the, the, the dairy program up in Penn state, um, created our ice cream base with us. Um, and it took about six months to perfect and to get the right, to get the right, um, recipe down. Uh, but we did. And, and that is what we're, we haven't changed that since. Yeah. I, I love, you know, the behind the scenes of, you know, something like this that, you know, for me, ice cream was kind of ice cream, but it's, it's fascinating to hear, you know, how much goes into it and and how, how, how much difference there can be in terms of quality. And, you know, speaking of, of kind of quality, uh, or, or at least the, the way in which you guys are, you know, offering quality milkshakes in terms of the menu offerings, and then we can kind of shift gears to more of the, the, you know, fundamentals of the business model and and types of franchise owners you're looking for. Um, this is, this is different than, I guess what I would, would consider a lot of the, you know, kind of dessert franchises that have really exploded onto the scene, you know, over the last few years, like, um, I get asked about crumble cookie all the time. And, you know, there's, there's been some cookie concepts and, 
you know, there's there, I mean, you guys are not the only milkshake concept out there. That's, that's franchising. Right. And, and, you know, from what I've seen with some of those, I won't call out any names, but I'll say that I have a son named Mason and one of these opened up in our town. So, you know, we wanted to go and like try it out and get him a shirt or something like that. It was like a one-time thing for us. We have three young kids, you know, it was a 20 minute experience. It was overload in terms of just the menu options you know the thing came out and it had like this much whipped cream on top and all these different toppings and you know we sat outside to eat it because we weren't going to put it in the car like you know the kids had a couple bites each and they were kind of over it you know and and we got a cool mason jar to, to bring home with us and and now we've got our souvenir and we probably won't go back that's that's not how you guys are doing this these are not like the the crazy, you know, eye catching gourmet, you know, milkshakes that someone may try once just so they can post a picture of it. I mean, these are just good old fashioned, obviously very high quality milkshakes that people are going to, you know, keep coming back for. Is that, is that an accurate way of describing it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, and that is what we pride ourselves on. We go back to our, our classic roots of, of where we, how we started making milkshakes and yes, we have flavors for today, but we are not your over-the-top freak milkshake. I am not putting a piece of pie or a piece of cake or a donut on top. We're actually making the best quality milkshake itself that you can find. And by using those best quality ingredients that you make all those desserts with. So uh, we have bananas foster and we have uh, chocolate dipped strawberry. Uh, we have uh, uh, confetti frosted cupcake. Like, those are are just really uh, our campfire s'mores like they're just really solid they're flavors that people want to have today but when you drink that milkshake it's like you're eating a bite of that dessert and yeah. that's the standard and the level that we're at um so and it is it's it's about the shake itself it's not about this looking and taking a photo and yes i will tell you they're beautiful they're gorgeous they have great toppers um, they're topped with chocolate or a, a s'mores pop or, you know, but they're not these freak over the, sh over the top shakes that, like you said, you're going to do once and that's yeah. it. That's yeah. not who we are. We have people that come back week after week, if not multiple times a week. Um, so I, it, it's, it's one of those, those treat yourself moments, but you, you, it's not a, it's not once in a lifetime vacation type spot. Um, experience well, and, I, and I'll add to that just real quick sorry to happen the I think one really important point here in, in your assessment I think is spot on Wes I think when you think about trends right and especially in franchising and brick and mortar being trendy is very risky right yes you're signing a 10 plus year lease and it might be great and then it's great until it's not right and then there's yep. examples of that you can see what happened with the frozen yogurt craze and other crazes that will go unnamed so we are very intentionally and quite frankly proud of not being trendy, right? Now, again, we'll evolve the times and we have a dairy-free uh, menu and, and we'll evolve that and everything else. Um, however, you know, milkshakes have been around for a century in the chocolate shop, which is still our core and all the handmade chocolate, you know, that's been around for even longer and Dana's family has been doing it for a century. So, you know, we think, you know, we, we want a business with a lot of very serious longevity, right? Yeah. If you think about even some of the other brands like a, a Kilwins or Rocket Man, Mountain Chocolate Factory, I mean, those businesses have been around for many, many decades, right? And and I, and I give them credit for that. So I think, you know, we we want to be a very long-term business. We are not selling anyone on, oh, it's the hot thing and get it now. It's like, no, we're we're doing great stuff and it's going to be great today, tomorrow, and in, in 10 years from now. So I think when I hear about people kind of getting all the in a frenzy about the latest trend, you know, I really challenge people to ask, does that trend have staying power? And by staying power, I mean multi-decade staying power, especially when you're talking about brick and mortar retail. Now, the answer may be yes, right? But it also might sure. be no, right? So I just you know, I think it's a really important point for, for potential candidates just to kind of think through on their own. Yeah. Well, well said. I'm, I'm glad you pointed all of that out because it's exactly why I brought it up. Right. I mean, I yeah. very rarely have someone come to me and say, Hey, Wes, I want the hottest new franchise that's <laughs> going to be on fire for like the next 18 months, but then I yeah. don't, I don't want it to be 
sustainable beyond that. Right. You know, you do get people that are like, Hey, what's, what's, you know, what's hot right now. I hate that question, but um, you get some of that, but no one's like, Hey, I want like the next trendy thing. That's going to be out of style in, in a couple of years. So uh, very important. I think distinguishment there. So, so let's shift gears and talk about the simplicity from a business model standpoint, right? Because that's one of the things that, that most food and beverage, you know, businesses kind of have a knock against them is difficult operations, you know, can be difficult from a labor standpoint, you know, food cost and wastage and and all of these things. So, you know, maybe just kind of walk us through the the model, you know, for Milkshake Factory um, and and where you guys have been able to kind of alleviate some of those common pain points. Sure, I'll hop in and Dana, you can fill in the blanks. Uh, I think the first thing to understand is, you know, this is not a restaurant, right? You don't need a giant seating area. You don't need a commercial kitchen. There's no, they're not frying anything. We're not grilling anything. There are no hoods. So in terms of the equipment and the build out, when I talk about capital efficiency, you know, of course we have an equipment package and our ice cream machines and all of that, but it's much, much simpler and more streamlined than even any F and B concept, I would challenge. Even the ones, you know, the QSRs and they're doing fried chicken and stuff, um, <clears throat> it is way simpler than that. Uh, so that's one. And then two, you know, because of that, it's a much better place to work. Quite frankly, right? It's not standing over a hot stove. There's not grease. There's not all the food. I mean, our stores are always spotless, right? So it's a very pleasant place for our employees to work. And then, like we mentioned uh, a little bit ago, around. It, it's really just the, all about that vanilla ice cream base, right? So it's vanilla ice cream, and then you know you, you you do do things to it to make to make all of our products. So that was makes it extremely simple. And what all that ladders up to is you don't need a whole bunch of employees to run the store to actually run the store. You know we have shift supervisors who can totally handle the store, and you have maybe you know three, four, even you know five employees if it's busy just running the store and executing and making sure customers are happy and making them milkshakes and selling them chocolate. You don't need, oh, I've got, a, I need a staff of 20 on hand for Friday night. I mean, on the entire payroll for our stores, it'll range from 15 to 25 people. And I've heard of other design, dessert concepts saying they won't let you open unless you have 70 on day one, right? 70. So, wow. yeah. So like uh, that, that brand will go unnamed, but that's where it, it's just much you know, as a potential, you know, business owner, you can kind of get your arms around that. And then if you can hire a couple key folks, and then, you know, we can get into the whole labor model and multi-unit um, in, in, you know, general manager versus assistant and you need a GM, et cetera. But when it's so simple to run, you don't have to load up your store with a bunch of high price management. Um, and, and, you know, as an owner operator, you, you know, you could, you could do very well for yourself or if you want to hire hire, you know, a, a GM, you know, there's certainly room to do so in, in, in the PL. So it's really, it's all about the core of the business. And we are very, very disciplined on our menu, but we're not, we're not chasing shiny objects and we're not doing new things. Um, we're not doing much food stuff. So that's, that's really kind of the, the magic of, of what we've created. Yeah, it's a great, great explanation. And and I think you pointed out earlier, you know, relatively small footprint. I think you said your your newest location is about 1300 yep. square 1300, feet. So yep. Is that is that about, you know, what what a franchisee? Um, yeah, I, I would say that's about the baseline. I mean, you know, our corporate stores, our smallest is a thousand. We retrofitted a yogurt shop, which was kind of that, you know, opportunistic real estate play, which is always nice when you can pull it off. Then we do have two stores that are up in the 2000 square foot range. So, okay. you know, we're talking to a lot of multi-unit folks that maybe want to build out an entire metro area and maybe they do want to invest in a, a flagship store. Sure. But I would think, yeah. you know, 1300 to 1500 is probably the sweet spot. And then, you know, we can kind of flex on either ends because we've, we've already done it, um, depending on, you know, it's really all about location is critical. And I would take an A-plus location that maybe is 100 square foot bigger or smaller versus a, a B-minus location. That's the perfect square footage because people drive by, they see Milkshake Factory, they know exactly what we sell, and they can't wait to come check it out, even if they have literally never heard of the brand in their entire life. Yeah, makes sense. Dana, you know, you talked a little bit about the fact that, you know, you guys are essentially making ice cream to order, you know, in the location. So 
I'm assuming that that helps, you know, a, a franchisee from a cost of goods standpoint where, you know, maybe they don't have to worry about ordering, you know, too much, you know, food or ingredients uh, and having some of that wastage or spoilage like so many other food and beverage concepts do. Is that is that fair to say? Yeah, definitely. Our our waste is is not that great. We actually do not have that many light items. What Dad Dan alluded to earlier of of just you know being how, how simple this is to run. Uh, but yeah, we do. Ju- we just we just don't. We just don't have a lot. We we kind of have perfected um, what goes into a shake and by a pump or a scoop or a dispense, and it is no room for error. You're not having these you know high school kids put in whatever they want or pour whatever they want. You yeah. know, you push a button, you, you pump something, you scoop something and you're, you, you spin the shake and you're out. So uh, it really is, as Dan said, uh, it, Sean really has made this, you know, he, he came in and said, how do I get a 15 or 16 year old kid at their first job to be able to operate the store just like anybody else in the, in the whole system would. Yeah. And that's really what he set out to do. And he did it. He nailed it. So, yeah, that's incredible and and very attractive from a, you know, business and labor model, you know, standpoint. Um, and, so- and just to space on that, because one thing that, and Dan, I'd love for you to jump in on as well, is, is that I don't want to miss the chocolate side of this. Like this is, this is essentially two businesses in one. And that's what makes this so unique. Um, we have, you know, where we started, we were a chocolate shop, we flipped things around, became known as an ice cream shop, a milkshake factory. Well, we still have that chocolate and that chocolate is, is a big part of who we are and drives a lot of traffic as well, especially at the holidays. But, um, as you get into this and you, you, people realize they walk in the door for a milkshake, they end up walking out with chocolate. Uh, and as we, the, every store has been the same, the longer we are open, the higher the chocolate sales are because people realize we have it, they taste it and they come back for it. it whether it's a snack item on the bulk bar where they're grabbing and going, grab and go a piece of chocolate, whether it's a stocking stuffer, whether it's a gift to take with a bottle of wine, a, a box chocolate and a bottle of wine to a, to a party. Yeah. Um, we become that destination as well. So Dan, if you'd like to jump in to add anything to that as well. Yeah, and it's just a lot of people don't even realize they're so excited about the milkshakes, but you're actually getting the chocolate business too. And we think, you know, our most successful operators, they'll, they'll actually create this chocolate destination for their communities as well. So you kind of, you know, we're oversimplifying a little bit, but you do get those two businesses in one. And if you have a really great uh, employee that can kind of talk with people, you know, they're not, we're not, it's not like a young used car lot. We're not pushing it on people, but it, a chocolate, you kind of walk them through this big, beautiful chocolate display after they order their shake, it's, it's a pretty easy upsell. And that yeah. turns an eight to $10 ring into a 15 to $25 ring. And you can really drive revenue off of the same foot traffic. And then we have a whole corporate gift program, um, which is, you know, you think about incremental revenue streams for the business where yes, we're the milkshake factory. Milkshakes will always be kind of the, the top dog, but we, there's a lot of other things that we do that really, uh, you know, make the business uh, economics a, a lot more appealing for, for those who run it well. That's, that's a game changer, you know, that, that opportunity to add to, yeah. you know, each, each ticket price a little bit. And and Dana, I'm glad you brought it up. Cause I, I meant to ask about that earlier. So, I mean, you know, you don't have to give specific numbers or anything, but in, in, in the two of your minds, is there, you know, for a somewhat established location, is there kind of a sweet spot in terms of the the revenue mix between milkshakes and and chocolates? Sure. I mean, in, in our FDD, you know, it's all in there, so we're not sharing any news here. Right now, chocolate's about 15% of our revenue. Okay. Um, you know, we had to get in a little defense with COVID in terms of change in chocolate operation. We're getting back to kind of the magic of our chocolate um, we got a lot of exciting stuff coming, but I, I think, you know, when we've been there pre COVID, I think, you know, 20 to 25% of revenue would be like, you're a good chocolate store. And some of our stores that have been open for a little longer are in that range. So yeah. that's kind of where, you know, it just takes a little time as everyone walks into the milkshake factory. A lot of them have no idea we have chocolate. And then you, know, you kind of get them into chocolate and they came for the Easter candy or their holiday candy or their gifts or whatever. And then they come back because it's great. And then you kind of have a chocolate customer for life is really how it works. Yeah, yeah. So that's, it takes a little bit of time, 
but if you're intentional about it, like Dana said, it, it's a huge deal in terms of taking a, a great business to a, a pretty amazing one. Yeah, that all makes getting, great sense. Getting the customer to understand our history and we came from chocolate also takes some time and education and, and that helps grow that percentage as well. Yeah, absolutely. No doubt. No doubt. So really uh, kind of a two for one with the the milkshakes and the chocolate. Um, so you, Dan, I think it was you brought up earlier, you know, that, that this has a lot of things that are going to appeal to, you know, the, the multi-unit kind of minded franchise owner or franchise investor. I mean, I know it's early. I know you guys are really just, you know, getting started on your franchise journey, but what can you share with us about, you know, in, in your eyes, as we sit here today, you know, who is kind of the, the ideal franchise owner and what, what is the ideal role for them to play in the business? Sure. So, you know, we're, we are we are saying we are multi-unit preferred right now. Uh, and really multi-unit does a, a couple of things. It makes supply chain a little easier for an emerging brands. Uh, and then two, it really, it helps unlock a lot of labor efficiency, right? Because these stores are easy to run. And if you have one store, you know, depending on, you know, are you going to operate it or not, but you have a GM, et cetera. But then, and we've done this, right? We went from one store to 10. As you build out more stores, you can have a GM or what we call multi-unit managers over multiple stores. And you don't need a GM at each store because they're so easy to run. So yep. I think, and then you always have, we're huge fans of promoting from within, right? Mm -hmm. Where you have a great person and, hey, you're an assistant here, but I'm opening up a new store. Do you want to come be the GM? And it just gives you so much more flexibility or you know, in COVID, we had, you know, five people sick at once and you could move people around stores, right? Where, you know, in one store, sometimes, you know, if a couple of key people, uh, you know, aren't available, you can you can be in a tough spot. So it just gives you a lot of labor, flexibility from a labor standpoint. And that ladders up to labor efficiency, which obviously ladders up to profitability. So that's a big reason why. And also it's nice to kind of build out a metro where you get more brand awareness if you can get, you know, uh, get multiple stores open. Um, so that's really why. And then in terms of the individual, you know, this is not passive income. This is not mailbox money. I mean, this is someone that, yes, you can hire a team and it doesn't mean you have to be in there spinning shakes at Friday night, but you really get out of it what you put in, right? And this is a people totally. business and it is on our owners to, to develop people, hire people and create that positive culture. And if they do that, we'll teach you everything you need to know about milkshakes and operation and the business and the labor model and all that. But but you have to care enough and willing to put in the work, sometimes hard work, to develop that and have that positive culture and have those people, which we are fortunate to have in Pittsburgh, of these completely irreplaceable people that are just essential to our business. Once you have that, it's great, right? So I think someone that kind of, you know, we're very transparent about that. And if yeah. someone isn't scared by that and says, oh, that's me, then great. And, and we know that's not everybody and, and that's sure. okay too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you've got to, uh, you, you're very smart to be transparent about that because it, it's easy for, you know, especially certain types of concepts to be viewed as, you know, more passive than others. And, you know, that, that may be the case in terms of like how hands-on an owner needs to be, but in terms of building that team, you know, you, you need franchise owners that are going to be very, very intentional about, you know, building a great team, a, a great culture to go with it. And that's where any any business has to start if the goal is for the owner to have not only great income, but but great quality of life to, to go with it. So I'm glad you guys are really, you know, talking a lot about that, it sounds like to, to candidates as they're going through the process. Um, you know, as, as we kind of, you know, start to wrap this up, um, given that you just had your first discovery day yesterday, which congratulations, I know that's uh, something that probably at one point felt like it was so far off. And, you know, now you've got it, got the first one of many under your belt. So that's, um, that's awesome. And, and so cool to hear. Like, obviously no names or anything like that, but like, tell us a, a, a few examples of like the types of people that were at this first discovery day. Like, was there other franchise owners there that, that have experience owning franchises, you know, corporate executives, like what, what were some of the backgrounds of some of these, these first groups that came? 
Yeah, it was a pretty diverse group and, and you know, a really great group. You know, we are we are very, very serious about finding the right partners. I mean, all of these folks that even make it to Discovery Days are highly, highly vetted, you know, through the, the broker process and certainly the repping process. So, yeah. you know, we're, we're being smart and selective. And I think even just kind of getting the invite to Discovery Day means that, you know, that there's a lot of potential. And, you know, you hit on some of them. I mean, some of them are kind of ex, ex-corporate folks or current corporate folks that are looking for, for a change. And I'm sure you see this you know, every day in your yeah. business. And then we also had a couple other, you know, pretty seasoned franchise people, right? Where I think this business is a great bolt on to an existing franchise portfolio. Um, some were existing food, they even had a dessert concepts and others were in, you know, in car care and home services and things like that. Um, you know, we're also seeing some, some, you know, restaurant owners that kind of, this is a nice incremental bolt on where it's, it's much simpler than what they're doing, but they already have an infrastructure and a team where it's a, a pretty easy bolt on. So, you know, a pretty diverse group, but all very, very impressive, highly qualified folks that we're looking, we really look kind of looking for the, the A plus players and the A plus markets, right? That's how we want to start. And we're being very selective about that. And I think, you know, both Dana and I were really happy with how this went. And, and it, was, it was just fun and the energy was high. We had a great time and we're all hanging out, meeting each other and drinking milkshakes. So it was, uh, like you said, it, it was kind of surreal in a way of it was this far flung thing. And then, you know, now here we are. Yeah, that's so exciting. Um, well, very cool. And and again, I appreciate you both, you know, making time to, to be here. Um, Dana, maybe maybe close this out and just you know kind of share with us what are, what are you most excited about you know as it comes to Milkshake Factory and and growing it into a national you know franchise brand um, you know as as you sit here today in the early stages of that what what are some of the things that you're most excited about? I I'm so surprised about the excitement that I get from people in the industry. I know we get excited and this is our business, our baby, but just to see what is out there. I will tell you that as a family, we did not set out to build a franchise. That was not our intent. We went out to build a business that made our parents and grandparents and great grandparents proud. And we just turned around and realized we built the business that was perfectly positioned for franchising. And so, as you could tell from the things that we've done our careers, we, we make very smart decisions. We think about things, but we jump on opportunities when they arise. And this was one that we knew we couldn't pass up. Um, especially with the sophistication of the the franchise groups of, and Franworth and the Repum group that that came along with it or that we built with this with this team. So, what what always surprised me about Milkshake Factory is the excitement around the brand. And there are uh, again, I'll, I'll send you this picture, but there's this there's 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 two highlights that I just am shocked at. One, a guy walked in. Uh, one of our recurring customers uh, came in last week. And he has one of our milkshakes tattooed on his arm, right? At his- <laughs> and I was like, I, this is incredible, right? Like just to think about that, right? That's, it's just, it's that's that just Joe Rogan that, level. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's, that, that was, that was pretty shocking. And then there's this other story I met, got to meet Tom Hanks a couple, a couple months ago at the white house for an event. And we ended up sitting right next to him. And he was, uh, this past year, he was filming a man named Otto in Pittsburgh, and he'd come down to the, the milkshake factory all the time because he was at a hotel nearby. No way. And I, uh, you know, I, we didn't, you know, I never met him, never talked to him, but he was great to our team and our customers, wait in line, it was a great guy, him and Rita Wilson. And so I got to meet him. My husband introduced us and said, hey, this is Dana, the owner of the milkshake factory, my wife. And his mouth hit the floor. (laughs) I was taken back by that because I was supposed to be the one excited to meet him. And he was more excited to meet me because I own the milkshake factory. That's so Uh, cool. And it was just one of these, like one of those things that sticks in your mind that there's just, whether it's Tom Hanks walking in the door or Joe Smith walking in the door, everyone comes in with a smile on their face and it's our job to keep and them And sometimes there. a tattoo of, of your and milkshake. And sometimes a tattoo. I think that guy needs a, uh, needs a gift card of something. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt. That's all amazing. If you can get Tom Hanks to get a milkshake factory tattoo, that's even next level. That, that would, um, that, yeah, that, that would, that would be your bar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No doubt. Well, it's clearly a, 
a fun, you know, business. It's, you know, putting smiles on people's faces. And, you know, I think that's an important thing for people to think about as they evaluate different business opportunities. You know, quality of life is is such a big part of what's, you know, motivating most people to, you know, explore business ownership and, and particularly explore different types of franchises. And my wife and I own two different franchises. One of them, you know, put smiles on people's faces. The other one is more of just kind of a, a necessary thing that, you know, it, it, obviously we provide value, but no one's giddy when we show up, you know, so there, there's a very big difference in, you know, what your, your day-to-day -day looks like, you know, owning the, the, the happy smiling customer business, or, you know, the one where they, they call you because they have to. So um, I think that's uh, you guys are clearly, you know, having a lot of fun while you're doing it, but it's also a very serious business opportunity. You're, you know, attracting very high quality, you know, potential franchisees. And uh, I I'm personally excited to, to watch you guys, you know, grow over the coming years, but um, really, really appreciate you guys. Where can people go if they want to, you know, follow Milkshake Factory online, see when one may be coming to their area? Where's the, the best place for people to follow you and check you out? Yeah, the best place is you know, our, our, we have our website, milkshakefactory.com, and we have a whole franchise development page there that kind of outlines uh, a lot of the, the core details. Um, you can find us on LinkedIn and then uh, I'm also starting to be a little more active on Twitter, kind of realizing that's a, a nice place to engage a lot of people in the franchise community. So I'm at Dan Reese 21 on Twitter. Um, Dana, did I miss anything? No, Instagram is, is our consumer side of things. If you want to follow yeah. us. Yeah. 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 Yep. We'll uh we'll post all the the social media handles, website links, all that good stuff in the show notes to make it easy for people to find. But Dan, Dana, thank you both so much. Uh, Milkshake Factor, everyone, go check it out. Thanks, Wes. Thank you. Thank you.